Hey folks, we're back for another episode of the Hot Rod Barbecue, another barbecue. Let's just call it that. Uh, this week, we've got a longtime friend of mine. His name is Jay Ward. Now, Jay is the man behind the scenes at some of your favorite movies like Cars from Pixar. He's the creative director for Cars uh, at Pixar Studios. And he's got one of those charmed lives that I think we all wish we could lead. I know I do. And you're gonna get to hear a lot about him. In the meantime, uh, as we always do, we like to pick a car from the Hemings Classified that sort of represents our guest. And this time, uh, I've picked a traditional hot rod. Jay Ward would call this thing a traditional hot rod. I like to call them revival rods. That's a whole nother episode of the barbecue. But we found one. We found a 27 Model T Ford pickup truck. And this thing is about as traditional a hot rod as we've seen on Hemmings in quite some time. Um, this thing has got the right bias ply tires. It's got the right Ford flathead. It's got the right three-speed transmission, quick change rear end. It's even got the right hairpin radius rods. This is what a hot rod in the early 50s would have looked like. And we've got one. So take a look at this thing and you'll see as soon as we dig into our conversation with Jay, why this truck is so appropriate. So we'll be back in a couple seconds with Jay Ward from Pixar Studios. Well, welcome back to the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue. Now, I will tell you that when we first started talking about naming this thing and called it the Hot Rod Barbecue, I had our next guest in mind. Jay Ward, who you will probably know by uh, most recently by the where he actually works, which is Pixar, um, has a long sordid history uh, with hot rods and barbecue and developing the entire, you know, sort of universe that the modern hot rodding scene that if you're listening to this podcast, you are probably aware of in some sort of way. Uh, and came into being. And Jay had a lot to do with that, I will say. Now, he may it, disagree with me, but uh, I believe firmly that um, the whole, whole idea of, and I will use the four-letter word, rat rod scene that we all hate, um, kind of came up through the late 80s, mid eight, late 80s into the early 90s, and has a lot of influence over everything you have seen when it comes to street culture, tattoo scene, uh, barbecue in Texas, uh, the California scene, et cetera, et cetera. Jay had a lot to do with that. I've always, I've always made that premise and we're gonna dig into that. So Jay, welcome to the Hot Rod Barbecue that you had to help in naming. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Unbeknownst to you. Yeah. No. <laughs> that was a lot. That was a that lot. Was a lot. I, that's, a, that's a lot to unpack. Look, I, I, I hate to lay all this at your feet like that, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> so Jay Ward, um, you are not too far from uh, the world domination headquarters of Hemings West here in San Francisco. You're over in the Oakland Hills, right? Yeah, East, East Bay. East Bay. And uh, your, your handle on a lot of social media platforms is East Bay Jay. Yeah, I've right? lived in the East Bay my entire time of being uh, in Northern California. Pretty much I've been in the East Bay since I was 17 years old. I moved to Oakland to go to art school at what used to be called CCAC. And now it's called CCA, California College of the Arts. But that's where I went to art school, you know, uh, like one year out of high school. I went to art school here and I never left. Wow, you've been, so you're, I mean, you're almost, now me being married to a San Francisco native, I'm always like five years off from being allowed to be called a, a San Francisco native. But as far as someone who has transplanted here, you're about as close as it comes to being a Bay Area native, I would say, I, right? I've, sp I've spent I've spent the majority of my life here. But the funny thing is, and you know this from being here a long time, it's a very um, transitory state. There's very few people that were like born and raised. Yeah. Almost everybody moved here you know, like the 49ers to get their gold. Yeah. Um, and some people just never left like us because we, I think, you know, you and I were both here at a really good time uh, when things were just starting to boom and open up and San Francisco was exciting. It was this thing of anything is possible in the Bay Area. Right. And so um, that's why I think we're both still here. Well, tell me a little bit about, and before we dig into, you know, the main reasons that you and I are talking on something called the Hot Rod Barbecue, take me back and take the crowd back a little bit to where you came from and your background that got you here. Because I know you came from the Midwest, right? 
Yeah, Kansas City, Missouri. People say, oh, you're from Kansas. No, Kansas City, Missouri right. uh, is, is my hometown. But we moved out to the Bay Area, actually to, to Modesto, to the Central Valley when I was about six or seven years old. And if you don't know Modesto, it's the armpit of California, I, I affectionately say. Um, it's where George Lucas went to high school. And the movie American Graffiti is literally about his high school years in Modesto because that town, which is 85 miles east of San Francisco, is such a car culture town. It's crazy. Like uh, the last Friday of every school year, everybody gets in their cars and would cruise the main strip, which is called McHenry. And we had the Turlock swap and we had, you know, tons of guys that were ex drag racers and sprint car racers and midget racers and all these people for some reason, Modesto in that part of the Central Valley was a like a little weird mini hot rotting bed. Um, right. Maybe because you could afford to have like, you know, room to have cars. And so that was there growing up for sure. Oh, man. And then you were, tell me if I'm wrong, you got into motorcycles and or worked at a dealership of some sort. Is that true as well? Yeah. I mean, younger? I was always a motorcycle guy. My dad got me um, a Honda, not a Honda, um, the Indian 50, the little Indian 50 when I was six years old. A little mini my, bike kind of thing? The mini well, bike. It's a little bigger than a mini bike, but yeah. No, it's really tiny. Is it's, it tiny? Uh, if you've ever seen American Pickers, they're like, they're, they're about the size of you. They, ha they have one on the show. They're about as up to your kneecap. I had one of those at six. And then I rode all the way through high school, dirt bikes and street bikes, got pulled over for riding dirt bikes on the street. Nice. Um, and so motorcycles were there. So when I got out of art school, I was doing freelance illustration, but it was hard to pay the bills doing freelance uh, illustration. Um, and so I got a job at Bob Drone Harley Davidson in Oakland. They used to be on East 12th Street in an old Studebaker building, cool brick building on East 12th Street, 744 East 12th Street. <laughs> and in the back, the service department had a working fuel pump from back in the 20s. And they said, hey, don't don't tell anybody, you know, by state law, you can't have a working fuel pump inside of a building anymore. But we do. And um, I started at the parts counter and the, the guy who hired me said, why? Why should we hire you? And I said, well, I built my own, um, you know, motorcycle in my living room, a shovel head, uh, rigid frame shovel that I built in my living room of my little apartment in Emeryville. So I, I think I, I would be good here. And so they hired me. Wow. That. Yeah. So we're going to that's, room and I that's, such, in that's such a hipster thing to do these days. <laughs> right. So that you were, you were pre hipster hipster, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, it was called having a low budget, but a high desire. What it right. was. Yeah. But probably you were probably not rocking a beard or $200 jeans at that point. Right. No, uh, I don't think I grow a beard at that point. Uh, <laughs> you know what's funny is when I built this, I, I, I had always wanted an FLH, a big FLH. I'd seen the, um, the Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols, he had this video where he's wrote, writing this big chrome FL in the 80s. And I was like, man, that is the coolest bike ever. And I could not afford, you know, 10 grand for a Harley. So there was a place called um, uh, Oakland Custom, which was owned by the Hells Angels. And I went to Oakland Custom. Uh, Sonny Barger was in prison at that time. Oh, wow. And I, I, I walked in there, and this is like early 90s, and a guy named Jim the Guinea Carlucci ran the place. <laughs> and he literally went by the guinea and I went up to him and I said, Hey, I, I want to build a, um, I want to build like a, a big shovel, like a, you know, big twin. And I said, I have this XLX, I have this Sportster. And so he said, I'll take your Sportster and then you can make payments of like, I don't know, two grand. And I'll give you just go in the back and pick out all the pieces to build your, your bike. And so I started with a shovel FL motor and a rigid frame and I, and I grabbed some five gallon tanks and I started building this bike out of pieces uh, in my wow. house, not knowing what I was doing and had a little checklist and built a bike. <laughs> oh my God. Now jumping way ahead, where's that bike now? Do you have any idea? Is it in it Japan? Would, it probably, I think, it, I honestly do think it went to Japan. It's funny. <laughs> by, by the time I worked at Bob Drone, somebody had um, a, a shovel FL, which is what I really wanted. By the way, if you ride a rigid for very long, the, the charm wears off when you get a, past about hundred miles. Um, and it was a beautiful ex police bike, ex city of Richmond police bike FL. And I bought that and, and sold what I called the great pumpkin. Cause it was an orange rigid oh, uh, FL. So good. And that was early nineties. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that would have been early nineties. That would have been 93, 94, right in there. Yeah. Okay. That makes, yeah. And well, that's a great tee up because, um, as I said earlier, I believe that, you know, you had a pretty big role or had a pretty big role in, sort of creating this, this hot rod scene that a lot of people are involved with and what they think of a hot rod now. I think it was influenced by you and the guys and the people who were doing this stuff back in the late 80s and early 90s. How'd you get into hot rodding? Because I know you've got some pretty cool cars and one in particular, that Roadster of yours, that Caddy powered Roadster, I think you've had for a very long time. Yeah. Was well, that the that, first hot rod you built? 
I built that 20 years ago. In fact, I'm, I just am getting ready to tear it apart and rebuild it better now. But yes, I built that 20 years ago. But way before that, when I worked at um, Bob Drone, I bought, um, well, actually before Bob Drone, even, I bought a 49 Lincoln Cosmopolitan Coupe. Wow. Which is a weird car. The Cosmo is a big one. You don't see them in a coupe. And it had the stock flathead, 337 inch flathead. And um, I think I bought that in 90 four and put a 54 DeSoto grill in it. Paul Borman was my buddy over at Borman Steel. He was always a hot rod guy. I joined a car club called the Lucky Devils, which was down in Orange County. I lived in Orange County for a year in 95 and really kind of got the car in good shape. Went to my first Paso Robles at that time. Yes. And I was like, okay, this is, this is, I'm, I've got the car now. I feel, I don't feel like a poser anymore. This is, this is the real deal. Uh, I had lake pipes and and loved that car. And, and it was early days. I built it for like nothing. I had a Gary Sampson from the Road Zombies chop it for me. And um, yeah, off and running at that point. Now, tell me a little bit of paint the scene a little bit for us, because I think a lot of people and I know the names that you've just mentioned and car clubs that you just referenced. But what was the scene like? And there was a scene. I mean, it was no doubt a scene. But who who were the players and who were the people doing this stuff? Where were they coming from? I know they're basically all yours and my age now. But yeah. at the time, you guys were creating something that really had this ripple effect heading sort of eastward across the U.S., but then westward overseas as well. Like, what was what was the scene like back then? What yeah. were you doing? Yeah, it, it was an interesting thing because in the Bay Area, things were so much more pocketed. You know, if you were into something, it was hard to find people into the same thing. And my deal was traditional hot rods and customs, you know, rockabilly and roots music, Western yes. swing, like this whole vintage scene, mid-century modern, all this stuff kind of intersected with each other. And there was some stuff going on in the Bay Area. There was a girl named Tracy Dick that used to do record spins. And you go to the city and you see one or two old cars, the Royal Jokers were a Bay Area club. They were doing it in the early nineties, uh, Jose and Javier Mejia, and San Francisco had a little scene, Gearhead Magazine, the early days of Gearhead. Early days. I went to Gearhead, yeah. I went to a Gearhead Magazine party in 92, and there was like two hot rods there. And I was like, yeah, oh right. my gosh, traditional hot rods. I had a big Buick convertible. I wasn't into, I didn't have something cool yet. And um, I wanted something, but I had to work my way towards it. And um, 95, when I moved to LA, the scene was so much bigger down there. Like there was the Lucky Devils, and there was the Blacktop Bombers, and there was you know, a Royal Crown review was playing every week at the Blue Cafe. And this was it, like the swing era, right? Like yeah, sort of nationally, it was a swing era, but that the hot rod scene was coming up through this, right? This 50s it, era rockabilly thing. Exactly. And I got a job at a place called the Doll Hut, which was like the Orange County epicenter of all that music as a doorman at the Doll Hut. So my, my brother-in-law was in Social Distortion. So when I moved down there, my sister married the bass player from Social Distortion. I got exposed to more because Mike Ness had a Cole Foster built uh, 54 Chevy. And I mean, it was like, it was, I was really starting to take all this in, met all these great guys down in Orange County. So when I moved back to the Bay Area in 96, I started to meet more people up here. And I thought there's no um, hot rod show in the Bay Area for traditional rods and customs. At that time, right. you go to a good guy show and they kind of poo poo you or ask you when you were going to paint it or mm. call it a rat rod. And it, it, it felt very disparaging. They didn't really want us because we didn't have the high zoo cars. It, we, we felt kind of out of place. And, it felt and oh, tell us a little bit about that. Like what's a traditional hot rod in your mind? Because I, like I said, this idea of a traditional hot rod, while you and I know, I think the rest of the world might not even understand what that really meant to us back then. Yeah. The, the, by the, by the time you get into the mid nineties and now we're up to the, 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 the mid to late nineties, um, if you picked up a copy of Street Rodder or even Rod and Custom, for the most part, guys were building uh, cherry red, magnesium wheel, uh, big in the back, little in the front, um, you know, uh, all billet accessory is the Boyd Coddington era. And um, not that that's bad, that's a totally different scene, but for a young guy who doesn't have a hundred grand to spend on a car, it didn't make any sense. But more than that, what I really got into was the roots of hot rodding and customizing. And when you go way back pre-war and early post-war, that's what I wanted to, because to me, it was the essence of a hot rod, which was less is more. And that's what I wanted. Right. And it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, uh, metal flake paint and it wasn't like a, you know, uh, radius or I'm sorry, radial tires and right. high dollar wheels and things. It was real basic, right? Right. And when you'd explain that to these guys, these old timer guys, they would be like, why would you ever do that? Like there's a small block now. Why would you ever put a flathead in something? You know, mm -hmm. why, why would you ever run on bias supply tires? They're terrible. 
and it was their arguments were all from the sake of um, comfort and convenience and and modern and why wouldn't you put power windows in your roadster and I and tilt, why wouldn't you have a tilt wheel to get your belly right. air conditioning the, yeah right. right right and I was like I, I I get why you've done that but it's so not my thing at 25 years old 26 years old I want the the essence the roots you had David Perry taking photographs of these yeah. great cars in this era. So all of it was going on. We began to find each other. I started going up to Vern Tardell's shop and I got his book, How to Build a Traditional AV8. Sure. And I was like, this is, this is the deal. And then um, me and a, and a friend of mine, Kirk Jones, decided we wanted to start our own car show. Uh, but we wanted to do a traditional rod and custom show. And nobody in the Bay Area was doing it. Nobody. It's like mid-90s? This is 96. We hatched the plan to do it. Okay. And so there was a deal down at the DNA lounge. There was a, um, like, um, Ray Campy or some, a rockabilly thing playing. So that's where the hot rods would come. Right. And there would be, um, the road zombies, which were Bay area club. There would be, uh, uh the saints Bay area guys. You'd have the Royal jokers. They would show up to the rockabilly shows and hang out with their cars. That, that was the car show scene. You'd go to, to a rockabilly show or a root show to see the hot rods. Right. And these car clubs were actually like sort of a vestige or a, or almost an homage to what was happening and being recorded in those early mid fifties car magazines. Right. Like you were, it was a lifestyle as much as anything else. Yeah. And yeah. We, we would do, you know, obviously traditional car club coats and the plaques and the whole thing was trying to emulate that era. You know, we, we would go to the San Francisco rod and custom show and seek out George Barris and, you know, get pictures with him or, Tommy the Greek or all these guys were cool guys, but um, there, again, there wasn't one show that celebrated that style of car that I right. knew, knew of. Right. So we were trying to push back against the billet movement and against the high zoot, high end street rod movement um, and, and have a show for us. And so we named it billet proof, which was the anti billet of so bulletproof billet proof was the play on words made little flyers. I still have some of them made them on a color copier. Wasn't it called the, the world's least important car show? Is that what you well, guys got? Exactly. It was all about just self, <laughs> you know, self-deprecation. And um, for, for us, we really were not trying. We wanted, we did not want high-end cars at the thing. We did not want power parker guys. We didn't want lawn chair guys. We didn't want the crybaby timeout dolls on the front fender. <laughs> we wanted, you know, all trick. that stuff is pretense. And what we wanted was drive your car, no trailers. We always, number one rule is no trailers, no trailer cleans. You drive it here. Right. And then build it yourself. Don't don't uh, just, you know, a lot of people can write a check and there's nothing wrong with that. But put your hands on your own car and know what you're driving. Yeah. And that was a lot of the early guiding light for us. So anyway, um, we had our first show at Albany Bowl in 96 and we had, uh, I think, 26 cars show up. 26. And we were stoked. And the Albany Bowl is basically like a, a, a throwback bowling alley, right? It was, and it had not changed in years and years. Is that true? That's true. And sadly, yeah. I think they just closed during the pandemic. I don't think they survived. Yeah, I think that's but, true. You know, for us, that, that's the hardest part, I'll tell you, for throwing a show. People always go, what, what's the hardest thing? Besides getting people to behave themselves, <laughs> it, it's, it's finding a venue that you can fit the cars in that has bathrooms and has food and uh, is a place you want to hang out. Right. And that, that, that's tough. I don't know if you've ever gone to a Luthgate cooled show, the Porsche shows they're doing now, Patrick Long and those guys. It, was wrong. that the one like in the, the lumber yard? You they know, did they one did, in the oh, lumber yard. They did. Amazing. Yeah. They do everyone in a different location, but they get it that, that the theme of where you are makes you want to hang out there for the day and take pictures. Yeah. That's so true. Well, and like you said, bulletproof back then, I mean, I remember seeing the early photos of, uh, bulletproof in an episode or in an issue of gearhead magazine and thinking just and i was on the east coast at the time i thought what is going on out there i want some of this you know so was that bulletproof seemed to really be uh sort of ground zero in a lot of ways for the scene at the time would you say that's true yeah i think what we did was we pulled it out of just having your car show up at a at a music deal and it became a hot rod and custom show of sorts for traditional rods and customs it was a um, it was a battle cry for let's take this movement back. We're, we're the young guys. We're the next generation coming up. We're not the gold chainer guys. We're the, the 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 young generation now that wants to build our cars our way. And we were going to Paso Robles. We had we had Paso, but we were kind of like this little section at Paso Robles, right? And that kind of grew as well. But this was a show just for us. There was no street rod stuff there. In fact, we turned a lot of cars away, and people got really angry. Did you really? Oh yeah, we had to. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah, we had to. We got, you know, a guy showed up in a Mustang for the first year and we said, I'm sorry, it's, he said, oh, it's a 64 and a half. It, you're missing the point. Right, right. We had, uh, you know, Kent Fuller, the like legendary chassis builder showed up in like a 73 custom Lincoln thing. And we're like, you're Kent Fuller, you're awesome, but this car is not what we're about. And he was, I bet he was not. I hoping. bet he was not happy about that. <laughs> no, but we we tried so hard to curate it. And, and you know, what you want is the cars that all talk to each other. They all make sense. They all work together. And Bulletproof was an annual event that it's still actually, it's still happening. It's yeah. still happening right now. I know it's changed hands a couple, once or twice. And I know that it has developed into um, something that I think you as a founder would probably still recognize, although I think it has really, you know, I think it really has still become now this thing where I see a lot of like under thirties showing up for this thing, but they are definitely taking seemingly definitely taking what you created back then. Huh, I can't believe I'm saying it's back then now, but what you took 20 years, stop yelling at the sky, Jay. Uh, so like, <laughs> what you took back then, you and Kirk took back then um, and and twisted and turned for your own purposes and, the, and a lot of us, I think that this under 30 crowd is now taking that and flat back paint, paint has sort of turned into like satin with giant 20, 30 inch wheels that are also painted black and murdered out, so to speak. But it's their own version of this stuff now, right? It's it seems like that. Yeah, and and that was always some. I mean, that starts to happen right away because you don't want to become the fashion police, where you know you're you're yeah. you're becoming as bad as those guys you're getting away from when you start right. poking at those cars. Um, but what I decided to do after I think five years of Bulletproof, I broke off from the show. I just left it to Kirk. Uh, I waited a year, and then I started a new show called The Asphalt Invitational. I and I literally still get calls from people saying, "I would." that was one of my favorite shows. I wish you would do that again. Yes. Asphalt Invitational was invite only. So they had to submit a picture ahead of time. Talk about curated, right? Like you really created it. Yeah. And that, that, made, it, uh, that made it so much better. Uh, we, we didn't care if we had a thousand cars. We didn't want a thousand cars. We had guys that came and chopped a Model A sedan in the parking lot. And we did this at Holiday Bowl in Hayward. So we had room for the right cars and the bowling alley was even better than Albany Bowl. It's burnt down. Yeah. Um, but, but again, uh, it was, it was taken it to another level. We did, we did um, asphalt invitation, I think for about another four or five years. And then I was like, it, the scene at that point had caught up. It was just everywhere you could go to a traditional hot. It was, I felt like we had done our thing and I got out. Tell me a little bit about your opinion of, and Hey, look, you know, no judgments here, but I've always felt that, Based on what you guys created back then, um, it it became sort of a launch pad for movements like the Von Dutch thing, right? And what happened to the Von Dutch name and brand, that I think turned then into what we now see as tattoo culture to some degree. You know, I think that, like I said, street culture and unfortunately, I would say like the Vegas Strip and all those goofball tattoo shops on the Vegas Strip and everything that's worn you know, like up and down that strip might have had something to do with the influence that came from you guys. What's your opinion of things like the Von Dutch movement and the Ed Hardy thing and all that? Well, it, it was going on back then. I mean, there was a, a Von Dutch clothing line that was happening when we started our show. It was before Paris Hilton started wearing this stuff and it exploded, but it was around and it it had a good basis in the early days. I, I, I can't really blame our show. I think what happened was as our show was getting bigger, reality television started getting bigger too. And so people anywhere in the US were tuning in and watching Monster Garage um, and all these kind of shows and they were getting educated about what they thought it was. And I think between our show and a lot of the reality TV shows, this whole spinoff, you know, um, bad boy, tough dude, uh, kind of thing what was, was one of the subcultures that spun off of it. It went a lot of different directions. It did, didn't it? It really yeah. did. And I think we're still seeing, I, we're still seeing it, you know, For or sure. some version of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I got to the point where build what you love, drive what you love, um, try to find the things that are less about just hanging out and more about engagement. So like RPM nationals or um, TROG, you know, these kind of events where you go and you engage with your hot rod and do what they're meant to be. They're participating, they're right? Participating way better. So the, I, I like that, that thing that things have gone to now. That's a really interesting observation too, because you're absolutely right. It seems like the things, the, the events and the movements that are really seemingly sticky these days are the ones where 
there's kinetic energy. There's actually movement. It's not just a parking lot show where cars are just parked and static for you know six hours. They're actually moving and you can hear them and feel them. God forbid you can actually maybe sit in one and take a ride in one, right? Like that seems to be the, the deal these days. Yeah, I, th I think so. And, and it's funny, our generation, you know, you and I who did this, um, we're, we're a little bit older now. And, and um, you know, what I want to make sure is I don't become that guy that I met at the good guy show. And Are you, so you're not going to drink Coors Light sitting in your armchair? Uh, you oh, know, telling or, other people what they've done wrong with their car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not going to do that? Try no. not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> try not. It's yeah. tempting, man. Or it's have tempting. a picture of my own car airbrushed on my shirt and oh. on my satin jacket so everybody so knows good. my car. So you good. Know, that, that's a big part of it, too, I think, Dan, is not letting your car become your identity. I think yeah. that's that, that's a big thing. A lot of these guys got so wrapped up in their car was their identity or their ego stroke that they, they began to lose reality. And I think always build something new, do something new, get into new things. You know, that's important in the car world. No, very true. And I think, you know, one of the things that you've done too is you've taken what seems like a very, oh, you know, closed off society to some degree. I think, you know, in some ways, car culture, we're, we can be very insular sometimes, you know, you have actually taken that even in your professional life have taken that to a, a level that most have never gotten to. And I would say that's with your career, right? And where you went as you're doing all this stuff with cars for your own pleasure, for your own lifestyle and how you interpret the world, you were actually starting off a career into this thing that has bloomed now into what you're doing. And you've got international influence now, I would say, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was honestly, truly just serendipitous and, and a, and a blessing I didn't see coming. I was still go back to when I was at uh, Bob, Bob drone and then Dudley Perkins, the first bulletproof, I was working at Dudley Perkins, Harley Davidson in San Francisco. Oh, wow. And I borrowed folding chairs from Tom Perkins for our registration table at the first bill of proof. Those white, those are from Dudley Perkins Harley. And um, that was 97 was the first bill of proof. 98, at the very end of 98, I got hired at Pixar um, as a PA, which if you don't know movie stuff, a production assistant is the entry level gig. I've been a manager at Harley Davidson, but I said, you know, this place is so cool. Even back then you had this energy about Pixar that I said, I just, I wanna work here. And this was, we used to be in Point Richmond in rental space. It wasn't even our own building. And you were a small indie uh, film studio, right? At well, the time? not quite indie. You know, oh, Disney, okay. Disney had always done our distribution. Um, by the uh, time I started, they had done um, Toy Story. They put them on the map, 95. Um, and, and I interviewed before the second film came out, A Bug's Life, which was fall of 98. And then I started right after, literally a week after Bug's Life came out. So the Pixar uh, was becoming a household name, but not quite. In fact, I told my mom, oh, I got a job at this place. And she said, is that a software company? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, they make animation films. And the reason people were confused was if you go back and you look at the first Toy Story poster, it just says Disney presents Toy Story and Pixar was like real small. Uh, so it wasn't a household name. Okay. Um, and I started on Monsters, Inc. And after Monsters, it became bigger. And then Nemo, it came bigger. And then everybody knew what it was. And I went from Monsters to Cars. And so Cars, I started on in 2000. And when I started on the movie, the director, John Lasseter, was like, you actually know about car. You're really like a car guy. I said, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, Doc Hudson should have this kind of tire. And by the way, yes. the bolt pattern is wrong. And by the way, they should have twin H power and, you know, blah, blah. And so I kind of got pulled into being a, a car sultant uh, on that movie. That's amazing. And I've, and I've even seeing cars for the first time, I remember thinking, ah, there's some Jay Ward influence here because, <laughs> you know, towns like Radiator Springs and, you know, like the, I think even, and I was watching, uh, I think it was like the DVD extras at one point or something like that. And I saw an interview with you where I think you had even mentioned that the firing order on, on, was it the- well, On Flo's V8 Cafe, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that was actually well correct. It was correct to a flathead V8. Yeah. So we, we did, the, we did. And part of that was, uh, you know, John had this super desire to make sure things were authentic. And so he never wanted to fake it, which I love that. Right. Look, it goes back to what I loved about doing early car shows was that authenticity when things are done well, you know, like doing a timing tag for a car or doing a water transfer instead of a vinyl sticker, those little things make something more authentic. And that's what I loved. That's so, and those little Easter eggs, if you're, if you're a car nerd, you will see those little Easter eggs throughout all that, that movie franchise, right? I mean, you'll see little things that may, others might not even notice. No doubt. Even, um, you know, Doc Hudson's racing tires, he switches to these uh, tires that say dirt track racer on them. When he starts to go back to his dirt days, 
it's the it's the pattern of a of a dirt track tire like tire. old style tires like we just we went nuts on that stuff with like the diagonal grooves like towards the edge of the tire with the straight yeah. grooves yep, yeah the whole right thing. yeah we did all oh, that that is really cool i when as you dug into that nowadays um tell us what you can you know, possibly tell us without, you know, uh, getting the, you know, the legal team involved, but you are now, you're, you're sort of the voice and, or at least the eyes and ears on the entire car's brand. Is that sort of true? Is that accurate? Yeah. So, so I'm a creative director for, for franchise, for Pixar franchises, but cars is obviously my baby. And, and as a creative director for franchise, what you're doing is you're overseeing other people's projects, Disney projects or external partners and saying, does this meet our standard? Is this authentic? If I'm a fan of this movie, does it make me like love the movie more? Cause they got all the details, right? Uh, so like if I go to um, if I go immerse myself in cars at Disneyland, you've had a lot of influence over that immersive experience, right? Like if I'm walking around and I see things and feel things and hear things, it's because if you've had some sort of influence over what that stuff is, right? Yeah, absolutely. The music, I help pick out the music for all the cues. We went to Hershey for the swap every year and bought all these little antique parts. I was telling somebody the other day, um, I was at the Barry Roaster Club's gathering that they did. I went with Steve Mole from uh, Oakland and um, somebody was asking, talking about Hershey. And I said, I remember going for Cars Land because we flew out to Hershey. It was myself and Imagineer. We got a cart or a wagon and we start buying stuff and we would grab two wheels and the guy was like well those wheels don't match i was like it doesn't matter and then i grab a headlight and a taillight and he's like well that's from a dodge and this is a chevy I go, it doesn't matter and we just load up the cart with stuff that looked good signs headlights taillights you know petrol stuff and we would go to the ups store ship it all back to tahunga you know burbank area and no go out kidding. the next day and now all that stuff in the queue area that's real parts real real 20, parts 30s, 40s parts that we bought at hershey so that's like the to- to keep it secret, did you tell everybody you were just a shopper for a Cracker Barrel? Is that what you yeah, told them? Yeah, to yeah. I said, yeah. we're just doing a yard display. We're just doing, yeah, Cracker Barrel. I said, no, you know, it's just, we're just doing some yard art. And, and that was kind of true. And that, yeah, right. You weren't, li- you, it wasn't a lie, Jay. It was a series of unrelated truths, mm, right? I like, like I mean, right? That. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next Hershey, use that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do another car sign someday. That, that was a, uh, that was transformative because uh, California Adventure before Cars Land was, it was okay, but it wasn't super popular. And after Cars Land, it changed that whole dynamic. Did it really? Yeah. Do, you, do you think that people now um, might see Cars Land as the destination first? You mean you know, before would, the movie? Right. Well, no, I mean, before, before they think of like maybe Disneyland, do, do people say, I'm going to, I'm not going to Disney, I'm going to Cars Land. I mean, it absolutely. seems like that, you, yeah. right? You have- Ab- absolutely. I think what happened was it used to be you'd go to Disneyland and they'd say, hey, you want a two for one? You can go over to California Adventure. People go, eh, half price. Right. Ah, okay. You know. <laughs> well, you could drink wine over there. Right. And um, told. Yeah. And now it's changed. Literally, it's people are, we're going to go down for two days. We're going to do one day at Disneyland, one day at California Adventure and go to Cars Land and all this other stuff they've added, which has been fantastic. We have a Pixar Pier there now and a bunch of stuff. So, oh, wow. Yeah. That whole park has become so Pixar focused in a good way that it's really improved it. But Cars Land was the kicking off point. Cars Land was such this immersive storytelling experience that it inspired the Harry Potter thing that they did. It did inspired, it really? I think it did. I mean, we wow. came first and it was the first time where it was like no holds bar, take somebody into a land and feel totally immersed in it. And, you know, we even put the Cadillac range higher than the power lines on Catella. So you felt like, wow, I'm in Radiator Springs. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Now, at Pixar, um, I know because I've actually had the great fortune to actually attend. You actually started another car show that's fairly exclusive, I would say. I mean, talk about invite only, right? I mean, this thing. Um, talk a little bit about Autorama if you can, or yeah, as Motorama. much as you can. I mean, yeah, Motorama, Motorama. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Motorama. So um, M- Motorama was an employee car show that I started when we moved to the campus in Emeryville from Point Richmond. So that would have been two thousand one would have been our first one and I already knew how to do car shows how to run them and I went to the head of HR and I said hey I want to run an employee car show you know barbecue and they said well you can do it during our fourth of July company meeting and people can look at cars after the company meeting I said great and I said can I have a little budget and they said well what do you want to do and I said well I want to hire a band to play live band and I want to have placards by the cars that tell whose car they are and little facts about them and they're like okay so I basically kind of birthed it well what was serendipitous was we had begun working on cars and started making relationships with manufacturers. So Ford, GM, all these guys. And 
when they got word, they said, do you want us to bring something? And I was like, yeah, well, what do you got? You know? And so I got, you know, Jay Leno brought the Echo Jet in the early days. Ford brought the concept of the 49. They drug it out of storage wow. for me. Um, I had a real Motorama show car. I had the Cadillac Le Mans show car from 56, 57. Um, it just, it kept getting leveled up. And then Porsche said, hey, there's this new car we have called a Carrera GT. Do you want one? And, yeah, please bring it. Uh, Fantasy Junction, which was across the street, they always brought over cool stuff. And it just kind of exploded into this really beautiful high-end show just for our employees. And people say, hey, can I, you know, outside, hey, can I bring cars? It's not actually open to the public. We, we, we don't do that. It's an employee car show where we have, guest manufacture vehicles right so yeah yeah it it became ginormous that is amazing i and like i said i the the little giveaway there i i got i kind of piled on i think to an invite because i remember uh tim condor had been building a bike for one of your one of a pixar employee yeah and because i that i think is how i got my t actually on into that show and which was a completely unfinished car. I mean, it was just bones. And of course that thing's still not finished. And that was 12 years, 15 years ago. Still <laughs> you'll, get there, you'll get there. I get one of these days before we're yeah. dead. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, what an amazing event that thing is. And to this day, you're still getting like, you know, manufacturers to show up with stuff that unobtainium, right? Stuff that you will not see anywhere else. Yeah. Well, we pivoted about, let's see, 2019 was the last show we did for the pandemic. And we, and we, change the the theme and the and the tone of it to alternative energy so uh, we had hydrogen electric um we had steam power we had anything but gas just just to see what what's out there right. so chrysler brought a turbine car one of the 60 turbine cars you know um leno brought something of course uh, of we course. had lots lots of evs lots of plug-in hybrids lots of weird stuff but it made it fun i tried to get a rubber band powered dragster to the event but i could so i couldn't cool. get it up in time but that that's where i think we're going now is um modern and classic but what what are alternative power means out there so that it has a a message for the employees of like hey look look at all this other stuff that's out there you know it right it, it doesn't have to be boring even if it's alternative energy yeah i was just gonna say i think that that's usually an assumption with you know with the with the gear headset you know, like, ah, all energy, I'm not gonna, you know, they think everything has to look like a Prius or, a, you know, a Tesla, but that's not necessarily true. And if I'm not mistaken, wasn't ga- early on wasn't gasoline, the alternative fuel wasn't wasn't it usually the water or steam or something like that, or coal that was, you know, 150 there, years ago, there was a there was a competition between uh, steam and electric, obviously you had Doble electric. and Stanley for steam. Right. You had, uh, you know, Baker for electric uh, and a couple other ones. And then, yes, you had gasoline. Now, gasoline was the loudest, um, but but gasoline was also super cheap and plentiful and you Mm. could go a long time. You know, battery, it was, they were much heavier and couldn't go as far back then, but it was super clean. Um, Right. Steam was great, but steam also requires a lot of work to get it set up and get it going. So that's why I think, you know, gasoline prevailed. And there's annoying little explosions that would happen every once in a while. Every now and then somebody would die. Yeah, like, yeah rivets flying at, you know, at bullet speed, whatever, right? Yeah, it's but I, I love the fact that we're kind of getting back to this uh, thing now of alternative, other other forms of energy. My, my thing is, is I'm a, I'm a car person. You're a car person. We, we love vehicles. There's a lot of vehicles on the road that are powered by gasoline, right? The, the problem is not, uh, the cars, the problem is what comes out of the tailpipe, right? It's, it's the hydrocarbon emission. That's what people are, are saying. Hey, this is, this is part of our greenhouse gases, right? right? So if we can figure out a way to make those cars burn more efficiency, more efficiently, uh, make less out of the tailpipe or something, I, I, w- I think we would want that. I think that would make sense. So whether it's biofuels, I know that Porsche is working on some biofuel stuff right now, or some people are converting their stuff to electric or whatever. I'm all for it. I think right. it's a great thing. I so. totally agree. I've And I've often said too that, you know, and what do you think of this? I've often said that these days, with some great exceptions, by the way, and I'll tell you, there are some great exceptions. I think you would agree with that as well. For the most part, I think like the average commuter car that someone's going to buy, whether that's a minivan or some sort of sedan, um, the way that they're designed and shaped and and developed these days, it's almost as if, it doesn't really matter if it's powered by gasoline. They're not really designed for an internal combustion experience of any sort. They're not built to have a great rumble at the tailpipe or you know to shake and 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 sort of rattle and hum at a stoplight and things like that. They're not they're not built for that. There's more 
there's more what i what did i hear there's more millions of lines of code in a new car than probably in your new iphone and if that's true i mean gasoline is almost i would say an annoyance to that experience as as far as what's happening at that commuter car level i mean obviously the the things from dodge and some of like the great you know racing um engines and uh, uh crate motors coming out of gm and ford are gr- amazing right and i think for gearheads like us i love that stuff a new godzilla you know crate absolutely but do i need my new vin- minivan to run on gasoline no i don't think so right does it matter i don't it seems like it, it's that that need is being designed out of new cars for the most part And you could look at it this way, you know, you have old cars, they need gasoline for every person that goes out that doesn't care what's under the hood to your point and buys an electric car, that's more fuel left for those that are into it. Right. So I would encourage, you know, all these people to, you know, for their daily driver, like you said, you don't need it. Great. I think we still have some things to figure out with the uh, power grid, what it can handle for that many people plugging in. In California, we have brownouts without cars plugging without, in. Right. I'm, wor- I'm worried about that. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. they need to do some infrastructure work. But every time somebody buys a Tesla and loves it, I go, cool, that's one more car not pumping at the tank when I need it for to keep my yeah. 39 Merc going. So I agree. My my, I will love to keep my, and I will keep my SRT8 300 and that's gas powered and I love it but my my 2013 mini I don't care if that thing is gas powered or not right that's it's fine it's a great yeah. little commuter I drove yeah. an electric mini the new mini e and it's pretty darn good doesn't have a ton of range but it gets around town just fine and that's probably coming right range is the next thing to figure out is that true yeah I drove the Ford Mach E they call it the Mustang Mach E I'm just going to call it the Mach E it's not a Mustang it's an electric uh, crossover and it's fantastic. And I had 250 miles of range on it. Wow. Um, it was the, one of the ones with the extended range. Did, drove it for a week, never plugged it in. And if you drove the right way and you learn how to like h- uh, harness the power back as you let off the pedal or as you hit the brakes, it, it'll recover some energy. Even without plugging it in, I still had tons of range by the end of the week just because of the way I drove it. And it was right. great. I didn't, I didn't miss gasoline in it at all. There's a really interesting, for those of you listening who are not in California and have not done the drive between San Francisco and Los Angeles, the sort of unofficial halfway point, if you run down Interstate 5, is Harris Ranch, right? Like that's where everyone stops halfway between LA and San Francisco. And there's this giant charging station there that seemed like especially i'm guessing it's still there i haven't done the drive in a while but like everybody who seemed to have a tesla or a fisker or something like that even 10 years ago they could make it to it almost seemed like they were designed to make it to harris ranch and then from there go in have a steak recharge for an hour and then come back out and make the rest of the trip it seems like range that definitely seems to be the 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 thing to solve at this point right and it's already getting better. I mean, Tesla's gone 300, they're going to 400. Yeah. And at some point it'll be plenty. I think if you have a home charger that's fast, it's great. I think you're going to start seeing those pads in the ground that will charge as you just park over. Oh, a pad. that's cool. I, I think it's going to get so much more slick. To take it in a re- complete reverse uh, direction, this conversation, I know that you have a sort of a passion project going on at the moment too, that you're probably still in the midst of. Um, you were really interested in board track motorcycle racing. Is that true? Are you still into that? Yeah, very Tell much. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what is a board track? Yeah, so, you know, in, in the 19 teens and 20s, before uh, tracks had developed to an asphalt technology, um, you had dirt racing or you had racing on boards, wooden boards. And um, basically, if you know what a bicycle velodrome is, this would be like a velodrome on steroids. Uh, they raced cars on them. You know, obviously, the Indy, they ran on bricks. But these wood boards were a lot less expensive. You could put them in multiple locations. This guy named Jack Prince would come to your town and say, hey, build a board track, and you can have races. Oh, wow. And they ran cars. Um, but motorcycles were easier on the boards, lighter. And the motorcycles could go super fast. So in the teens and early 20s, motorcycles were going 120 miles an hour on wooden tracks. With- really? 120 plus, no brakes, no clutch. No motorcycle. No. Yeah. <laughs> Just a so, single gear. Yeah, it was it was direct drive. And the only way to kill the bike was to hit the magneto, the ground, ground the magneto, and basically slowly come to a stop like pulling a spark plug wire. So you wow. couldn't stop quickly. Um, and that was for lightweight. Everything was about being light. And so no brakes, no clutch meant less heavy moving pieces. They were a thousand cc twins. Um, so tons of power. They had a leather pad on the tank. They would lay down on the tank and tuck in 
Wow. And, and race. And these guys were, I mean, killing it. Harley Davidson, Indian Excelsior, which Schwinn owned Excelsior. Those were the big three. And um, as I delved into this, I was like, wow, this sport is like insane. It was gladiator on two wheels. And these guys died on a regular basis. And it was like amazing. And it, it was gone by 1930. It's gone. Like they're just gone. Did the depression kill it? No, actually. And people said, oh, too many people died. And it wasn't that. It was actually that the tracks, um, because they were bare wood boards, they would just start falling apart. They would catch on fire. They would break. And they got expensive to maintain. And what these guys realized was you can have quite a bit of excitement on dirt for the same price. And that's ah. basically the, the birth of flat tracking came out of the board track era. So, so when you said, and you a little earlier, you had mentioned the velodrome. So basically the a velodrome is almost a 100% banked oval, right? Like there's no flat spot, right? You're flat, you're flat on straightaway. So as they stretch oh, okay. them out, they would do flat straightaway and bank turns. Okay. A little and bit steep, like, like heavily banked, right? Like really yeah, 40, steep. 45 degrees, sometimes, sometimes more. Um, because the wow. more you bank, the faster you could go without letting off. And the good guys knew where to go into the turn to bank and come back out. And they would run really, some of them ran really high. And your spectators were up above looking down. So your spectator oh. would see the motorcycles below them if they had a seat. If you didn't have a lot of money, you could stand in the infield. But the good wow. seats were up in the stands looking down. Looking but down we, over the track. Uh, yeah, over the bikes. And um, there was a famous wreck that happened in 1913 in Altoona, Pennsylvania, where a guy named Eddie Hasha flew into the crowd and killed people and a little, oh. little kid died. So it was a gnarly, gnarly sport. It was not not for the faint of heart. And these tracks, I've seen pictures of this stuff, but describe what these tracks were, because you board tracks, that's saying something, but describe how those board tracks were constructed. They were like almost, I don't know, I don't know if they were two by fours, but they were kind of up on end, right? Yes. Yeah, two, thousands of these things. Yeah, I think they were two, uh, two by sixes laid on their edge, stacked up by gravity, held, held down by gravity. You couldn't use nails because a nail would 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 pop back up. So the boards would would come loose if they got hit the wrong way. And so guys oh would my gosh. hit a board. And also when they wreck, they would get splinters. I was uh, just going to ask you about that. What was that? If So you wreck on these boards and you're doing 100 plus miles an hour on a, yeah. on a bike with no brake and yeah. a clutch. <laughs> And you hit splinters. That's just the added insult, right? Sort of like like boat racing. You there's the, there's the wreck, but then there's the added insult of possibly drowning. Like on yeah. these things, right? Like you could actually just get speared by giant wood splinters. Is that true? Giant, giant splinters, and uh, the bikes were constant loss oil system. You know they didn't have a recirculating system, so the track became slippier, greasier, smokier as you went. Wow. So if you're in the back, it was not a not a not a good day. You did not want to be in the back. Oh, my God. Um, how many of these, like, what was a field like? I mean, were there 10, 25, how many? 20 to 25 bikes, sometimes really? more. Uh, the, the, the tracks would be pretty wide. There's great footage of Beverly Hills in 1921. You can find the, just type in Beverly Hills 1921 board track race. You'll see it. It's online. And uh, it's nuts because there was only two ways to start the bike. One was to get a push, but they were super high compression. The more popular method was a guy in front of you on another motorcycle and you held onto a rope and he pulled you until your bike started <laughs> and then you let go of the rope. These guys are nuts. That's insane. <laughs> they wore a leather uh, football helmet, like an old time leather football helmet, a, a, a sweater, like a thick sweater, which would say Harley or Indian. Gloves, sometimes, sometimes not, because that wasn't, cons a lot of guys wanted to feel the what they were doing. Like Dale Earnhardt wanted to have an open face helmet. helmet. Right. These guys wanted to have their hands on the grips, but that also meant when you fell, your hands would be. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. So that you could really do some damage to yourself and others if you, know, if you laid one of these things down or wrecked or something like that. And it happened on a regular basis. It just, it had happened more often than not because it was such high speed with no brakes and so many things that could go wrong. And the technology, this is a hundred years ago. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I, that idea intrigued me. At the same time, my wife and I just had our first child and I noticed that she was very um, stubborn and strong-willed girl, which I loved about her. You never want to take that little will out of her. And I thought, it's cool. She can grow up and be like this now, but what would it have been like for her a hundred years ago, right? Amelia Earhart and the flappers started to change uh, women empowerment. This women's suffrage happened. Where women finally got the vote. Over 100 years ago, women couldn't even vote. Yeah. And so I started thinking about my daughter growing up. If she had a love of motorcycles the way I did, would I be okay with that? Would I be willing to let her do something that I knew she loved, even if it might hurt her? That's that's the hard thing for a parent to do. You know, if your child came home and said, "I want to get into skydiving," you'd be like. Uh, I don't, right. I don't know, but <laughs> maybe <right>? not. <laughs> so I wrote this father daughter story um, about 
uh, a dad that used to ride that got hurt in the early days of the sport, never able to ride again, but he raises this daughter who has a natural, better than he ever was on a bike. And how does he make that decision? And the story kind of kept getting better and better. And um, I got very fortunate because Allison Schroeder, the woman who wrote Hidden Figures, uh, wrote the script for my story. So oh, wow. yeah, so we have an Allison Schroeder script and we're getting very close to basically funding for this thing. We're going to try and do it through independent means to fund the movie. Um, wow. And it's going to be phenomenal. I mean, really cool. Father-daughter story, board track racing. It's going to be a family film, lots of action adventure, bikes you've never seen. We've got a lot of very talented people that are going to be working on it, but yeah, we're just working on funding. So is there, is there a scene for these early bikes? Cause a lot of these things are so obscure, like, right. I mean, a hundred years ago, 112, 115 years ago, I'm, I'm assuming that there were as many little bike companies out there as there were car companies that were just, they were the startups of their day. Right. I mean, are, are there, I've seen in some ways, um, you know, different motorcycle concours events and things where bikes, where I thought I might've heard of all the brands of bikes out there. Here comes five more that I'd never heard of in a million years. Are these, are these things still around? Are people finding them? Yeah. You know, obviously Dale Waxler, who just passed away a few months ago was one of the best. He has the wheels through time museum. He found some super obscure stuff. You're, you're right. You're absolutely right. There was so many motorcycle manufacturers before the depression hit that made you know, bikes for a year, two years, they're out there. There's tons of them, both in the US and in the UK, we're two big bike making countries. Um, you know, there, there was a bike called a lake, there was a bike called a Pope, there was a bike called a cyclone, you know, all, all, all these bikes were board, they made board track versions. And there's some of the most valuable bikes in the world are board track bikes. Is that right? These yeah. Are, oh, man, they must be just they must just be like little aliens in the motorcycle world, right? I mean, with they something's so purpose built, I would imagine looks a lot different than what people think of as a motorcycle that passes them on the highway. It looks like a hot rod. It, it does. It's the essence, right? When you build a hot rod, you lighten it by taking the fenders off and and taking the running boards off. And this is the same thing with a board track bike. There's no fenders. Um, it has low handlebars. It has no gauge. No way to go. Know how fast you're going a chain just going from transmission, you know, to, sorry, engine to transmission, transmission to back wheel. That's it. It's as bare bones as you get. The exhaust pipes are about nine inches long with fire coming out of them. You have pedals, you know, like the way that bikes would start, but the pedals are, are locked in place. You just rest your feet on the pedals. Okay. As opposed to having actual like floorboards, you've actually got pedals. Pedals. Yeah. Cause that's, that'd be lighter. Smaller, yeah. Right. Smaller right. Right. Have. Yeah. <sighs> it's very, it's very much the hot rod of its day. That's amazing. And, and I know you've been, like you said earlier at the head of this conversation, you've been into motorcycles for a very long time. Um, I've always felt like if someone wants to get into the car scene or just the gearhead lifestyle in some sort of way, it seems like motorcycles are a great kind of gateway drug. I mean, they seem, you know, they're more portable. You can get them in and out of places easier if you're living in an urban area. And I would say that the under 40 under 50 crowd at some point was making a migration back to cities from the suburbs and things. Do you, what's your feeling about that? I mean, are motorcycles still um, the way to get into this stuff? Is it easier or harder? Is, are they priced out now? Is it, what's the world like of motorcycles these days? Well, you know, I, I just watched an interview with Cole Foster the other day and he was saying, I like doing bikes because you can build them so much faster so much quicker than you can a car. As you know, you're still working on your T. Yeah. You know, if it was a motorcycle, you get it running at some point, you ride it around and keep going on it. But with a car, there's a lot more systems to, to deal with. It requires more space to store. That's, that's why when I was in college, I didn't have a car, I had no room or money for a car, but a motorcycle, I could keep it in a closet. Yeah. Um, I, I would right. never, yeah, I would never encourage anybody to get into motorcycles if you're not into it, because it's not the, it's not for everybody. I would never say, Hey buddy, you should take up motorcycling. <laughs> but, um, yeah, for me, it was it was a less expensive way to, to get into something. You know, you go to a swap meet and pick up your stuff and, and build a bike for a half the price of a car, if not less. Man, Jay, this has been amazing. Dude. I really appreciate your time We're coming up on an hour now. And I know you got other things to do. And I really appreciate it. I'm sure Pixar is knocking on the door somewhere for you <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> I have to check my email. Yeah, you got to check your email. Yeah, <laughs> but but man, thank you very much, man. This has been great. And I really appreciate you being on here. And I'm glad that the rest of the world gets to see like, you know, these behind the scenes people and personalities who really set the stage for a lot of the stuff that we enjoy nowadays this is what the hot rod barbecue is all about. Right. And I really appreciate you being on, man. Thank you. Yeah. Right on. It's great talking to you. It reminds me a lot of the early days and 
it's it's funny, you know, you go through cycles in your life. I kind of got out of, I, I kept all my cars, but wasn't like into them every day as much as I was. I kind of went off and I bought an old 911, got into a little Porsche stuff. I started judging at Concours and doing that car yeah. stuff. But now I'm coming back to my hot rods again and going, I want to fix these things up and fix enjoy them. So look so at you, you old, you old man, you. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, look, we we both got the hair we're still rocking the hair grease we just we just can't let it go can we no no it's a good look, <laughs> good it's look. classic man it's timeless it's timeless <laughs> <laughs> all right jay thanks so much man thank you Dan. we'll see you at a show somewhere yeah you too brother all right, all right. see you bud. thanks for listening folks and again please subscribe to the hot rod barbecue podcast if you're on spotify check us out there subscribe to it on itunes And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button and we'll come to you every week. 